Python is more than a better bash. He will show us hands-on examples how to solve small and uh, larger pro uh, problems in operations and maybe what not to do. All right. right, thanks. Thanks for coming. Um, so everybody realized that there's a lot of background noise up here. Um, am I talking loud enough? Is that, can you understand me, especially in the back? All right, thank you. Um, I didn't really expect such a small screen, um, and I'm going to show a lot of code, and uh, I tried to give my best to make the code as big as possible, but <laughs> this, is not, this is not just two lines. Um, if you have a computer with you, then you have a chance to enter that URL in your browser, and it's going to give you the presentation as I show it, uh, and you ha might have a chance to uh, see the code a little bit uh, easier than reading it up here. And if anybody has a problem understanding or seeing something, then just raise your hand and I'll try to just spell it out. All right, okay. So the talk is about uh, Python as a sysadmin or as a DevOps, would you, uh, uh, as you would say today. Um, thanks for joining me. Um, I do two th um, I'm from a company called Flying Circus, and we do DevOps as a service, so that's basically my job. And um, if you're developing stuff and you would like somebody else to do all the nitty gritty things, then you can hire us. And also, if you like to do that stuff, then we hire people. So um, both ends, in and out. All right, um, a cornucopia. Um, what is a cornucopia? Um, it is that. Um, so Wikipedia uh, translates the Latin for us and says it's a horn of plenty, something where you get lots of things from, especially um, uh, food, uh, flowers, nuts, produce, etc. And um, it keeps on giving, right? A cornucopia, you just get more and more and more, uh, and that is what Python and the community is for us, basically. And uh, I guess the, the comparison with this horn that has been broken off from a god, um, I could make a cheesy comparison to Guido having <laughs> given that to us. Um, all right. Um, so Python as a sysadmin, um, gives me two things that are conceptually relevant. Um, one is uh, pragmatism, uh, and the other thing is the ability of wherever I am at the moment with my code, I can I have a continuous path forward. I can I can evolve it. Um, so so pragmatism uh, for me means that I can de quickly develop something that I need to function right now. Uh, so typically in Python, you make a one or two line script. Uh, for analyzing data, for uh, adapting output from one uh, application to another application. Um, and at that point, typically when I get a request uh, where I have to do that, uh, that stuff needs to work right now, uh, and it has to be robust enough that I can leave my desk job at 5 p.m. Uh, and not uh, face like a huge burning uh, pile of shit in the next day. Um, so things that we do there is stuff like parse Nagios, that is data, to feed it into the next newer system. Um, um, we have something where we uh, aggregate um, telemetry data. Somebody, uh, so the, the last person was presenting, um, uh, what was it, Prometheus, right. So that's one part that we have and we use CollectD at, at some point and so we feed data with CollectDs around and uh, we write Python code to um, put things in between. And um, so with pragmatism, it's important to be fast. Um, at that point, I don't, I, I don't really think about architecture. So there's a certain language that starts with J, where uh, whenever I see people storing something, the first thing they do is architecture, and you get lots of produced boilerplate code. And with Python for us, it's the, it's the other way around. I actually can work with two or three lines of code uh, and have something that expresses my core idea and uh, tells me whether I'm actually doing the right thing uh, on the business level before venturing into blowing it up into a huge architecture. Um, and as I said, I want to be able to actually then put that little script away and have it ch uh, chumming and humming and doing whatever it's doing without uh, getting my back. Um, so the uh, second step, the moving forward part, um, is the uh, is the thing of fix it twice. That's a typical admin saying, right? Um, you get a request, something's broken, you fix it with some Band-Aid, but you have to make a note that you go back there tomorrow to actually fix it actually for long term. Um, and that is something where 
Python for us makes it not fix it twice, but maybe fix it 1.5 times, uh, something like that, because uh, usually the Bandai that, that we develop um, isn't something we have to throw away, but that we can improve upon, because the three-line code is not something that is just toy code. It's something that you can then start developing forward. You can start adding architecture. You can uh, start with three lines that are just imperative, and then you turn it into functions, you turn it into classes, you add unit tests on top of that. And that is something that is extremely valuable for us. OK. Um, let's get a bit more practical from uh, having that initial look of why Python is a good idea for us. Um, so what are we doing with, uh, with Python? And basically, Python is everywhere for us. It's our first go-to language. There are a couple of very, very small specific things where we use uh, Rust at the moment for like very, very small uh, system uh, utilities. But uh, everything, and this is mostly, if you look at it, is glue code type of things. Uh, and that's always Python. Um, so um, yeah, everything. And now the question is, what does Python do in these places, and uh, what are we using uh, from the Python ecosystem? Um, I've tried to group it a little bit. Um, there are a couple of um, language features that I like a lot that allow us to be very efficient, so like decorators and context managers, and can show some of that uh, uh, in detail. Um, the standard library is fantastic. Uh, there's always things that you can just use and you don't have to start installing things. This is why you can have a single script without having to think about how you package it, how you, uh, how you compile it, and how you can just put one file on the server. Python is everywhere, and maybe you only get Python 2.7 or Python 3.4, and it's so compatible in general that we don't even have much of a problem of juggling between different versions. Um, there's a fantastic ecosystem of things that we use a lot from third-party libraries, like struct log, requests, stuff like that. And also the whole ecosystem around packaging has evolved a lot over the last 20 years, um, where we use various things in there. Um, testing, PyTest, uh, together with coverage, is a really good tool. Um, and we also have some app we also develop some more bigger application things where we use Pyramid and SQL Alchemy and stuff like that. So for that talk, for getting in detail and looking at code, I'd like to highlight uh, a few things from the, from the left, from the left. Uh, some language features that we like. Um, Async.io is really fantastic for us. Uh, a couple of the uh, external tools uh, and third-party libraries that uh, we're touching. So um, who of you does not know uh, context managers? Everybody knows context managers. OK, so hands up if you know context managers. That's awesome, OK. Um, so I don't really have to explain the mechanics to you. Um, so one thing as sysadmins that we typically have is we think about edge con uh, race conditions um, of uh, what can go wrong if you're trying to interfere with a system that is in kind of a um, state in between. And something where you can use context decorator, uh, context managers is opening files, writing it, closing it, making sure that the life cycle of the file handle is limited to that scope, uh, to that one block. And the problem with that is it's not as atomic as you think it might be, uh, because that one write call may translate into multiple syscalls on, uh, in the system, which means that while you're writing, something else could be writing as well, or somebody else could read it in a, in a state that you never thought is possible and stuff like that. Um, so a colleague of mine gave actually a full talk about this one thing, um, so I'm going to uh, shortcut that. And so what we have is we have a, uh, a different context manager um, called Rewrite, and that one guarantees you that you get a temporary file that reflects the current state. Um, you, um, does that one reflect the current state? Um, no, it doesn't. OK, that, that one gives you a new file you can write into. Um, and then when you exit, it does an atomic rename. Well, the display doesn't allow me to use the. Um, so the last step um, in the exit uh, gives you an atomic rename. So every consumer uh, on the system will have the guarantee of seeing either the old file or the new file. Because on POSIX systems, uh, the rename is atomic. You don't get the chance of seeing uh, something mixed. Um, so that's one thing, context managers. Um, then we're using decorators. Um, 
I guess all of you know decorators. Anybody who doesn't know decorators? That's awesome. Okay, you, you know Python, I talk uh, about sysup and stuff. Um, something we use uh, decorators for is, for example, where we have a library that provides us with command line interface uh, functions. So these two functions uh, would be, or actually methods, would be mapped onto a command line interface and we want to make sure that uh, they can't run at the same time, so you use some locking. Uh, and that is where uh, decorators are just awesome. The locking code itself uh, is interesting because uh, you have to be careful at that point, and this, is, this looks much more involved than you would think uh, initially. So you use uh, a lock file, and that, in that case we use uh, some temporary file, so I think e either the PID file of this thing or whatever. And something you can see going on there is that we're counting locks. And that is important because if you use decorator like that and your program turns around and calls the CLI method itself, and we do that because we have, for example, composite methods. One of the methods uh, was called restart, and restart turns around and says, I'm just calling the stop and the start method, which in turn want to be locked as well. So they would try to lock it again, and when they exit, it's called re-entrance, when they exit, the method that was called later unlocks, because the, uh, the, the, POSIX, uh, uh, at the, the POSIX utilities don't know about counting how many times your process has locked it. That's something you have to do yourself, and with Python, that's actually quite easy. All right, now, what happens when you start combining those helpers? So let's say you have a file, a method that you want to protect through locking, and you want to rewrite the content. Now, you've dug yourself a grave because if you use the rewrite while this thing is locked, it's going to move away the file. The next person calling your utility will see a new file, and even though it's named the same way, it's a different inode. And POSIX is going to say, well, that thing isn't locked. You lock the old one, so he can lock the new one, and suddenly your code runs in parallel. So doing these kinds of low-level stuff and then wrapping it up in nicer packages, you have to be really careful when you start recombining them because the guarantees don't always uh, uh, combine as you think they do. This actually caused a huge pain for us. We, we didn't know that upfront, so I'm telling you. And you're going to forget that, and in two years you're going to stumble over the same thing because it's really hard to remember. Um, Another thing that we really like, uh, we aren't actually using it uh, that much yet because Python 3.6 is just out, is um, you know string formatting. And this is a piece of code where we um, format the command line string for uh, calling QEMU. And as you can see, there is uh, string format going on. But the parameters are using curly braces and double curly braces. And that is because we have a two-step two process here. One is we create an argument list that is specific to the virtual machine, but independent of the host that it's running on. And then another pass will pass in uh, arguments for the host. Now, um, this requires us to both double quote and run this list through, uh, through a filter, through a map. And if you move that over to string formatting, from my perspective, uh, f-string based formatting, that becomes much easier to read. Um, my editor doesn't highlight that correctly yet because it doesn't know about f-strings properly. Um, but now you just mark, these are the strings that I want to expand right here, and these are the ones I don't want to touch, and you don't have to double quote, and you don't have to filter the list again. Um, this is also really nice if you do shell-style programming in Python, where you call sub-processes and you try to uh, have like multiple of them. You don't always have to call format, call format, call format. Uh, and that is quite nice. So this is really fast, right? I'm just showing you uh, stuff. Um, the async IO things. Uh, we're using async IO to, in an actually pretty stupid fashion, um, something that uh, we do is we have a backup utility and that has a scheduler, like a glorified cron thingy. And for every backup job, we start an infinitely running, you see the while true, uh, infinitely running Coroutine. So if you have like 100 or 200 clients, then the server will start 100 or 200 of these uh, functions in parallel. And because the coroutine, at some point you can say, um, I'm expecting this to take a long time. You do that and you come back to me when you're done. 
Um, so two steps that happens. One is you compute when do you want to uh, run the next backup job. And this is kind of involved with how you create the deadline. Uh, and then you tell it, okay, here's a function that takes a really long time. Please run that in a thread or whatever for me without me having to take uh, much care. And you can actually just keep that as a serialized piece of code. Um, if you remember Twisted or if you know callback style programming, this is really nice. Um, and we also have uh, integrated that with a Telnet server and um, some background jobs. And the overhead that you have to do uh, to get working async I code is really, really small. And this is what the others do. So that is, that is uh, uh, start this one async method uh, for continuously saving the status file. And this thing is really just stupid in the sense of like, write the status file, sleep for a while, be happy for uh, uh, waiting for asynchronous stuff um, to happen in, in the background. And what I like is that it, the, the non-callback style uh, reduces the, comp the complexity. It's really just serialized code. And the second thing is that it guarantees you that Python is not going to interrupt your code flow until you say either in the new Python's a wait or yield from. Um, so with regular threading, you would have to be prepared whenever, uh, I'm not even sure where the border is, I think between bytecodes, uh, Python can interrupt your thread and pass that over. Uh, and here, uh, my code knows that everything will run. So I can use lists and unsynchronized primitives and, and just modify them. And I know that nobody else is going to step in. So you don't have to do locking and you don't have to uh, think too hard. And that is really nice. For something else, uh, struct log. Uh, anybody who knows struct log? Okay. Now you're learning something new. Excellent. Um, struct log is a library by uh, Hunak. Um, ah, I accidentally duplicated that slide. Uh, Hunak, who doesn't know them, him, uh, really great guy, does a lot of SSL stuff. Um, so he provides a very simple API for um, recording structured data about uh, events that you want to log. And it's um, also that uh, you carry around log objects in at this point moment, I'm carrying one on that specific object. And you can create log objects that contain prepared data. Um, I forgot to make a screenshot of that. Um, so the log object knows I'm in this part of the application, like I'm in the main loop, and the main loop can pass that one over to the QEMU uh, submodule, and that sticks on it. I'm QEMU, and you keep passing on the log object, and everybody who actually logs something has accumulated all that context data, and it will be included, and you don't have to retype that all the time. And it's really nice to actually create nice format, formatted output with that. So I'm not just using that for logging. I'm also using that for command line uh, interface output, and then writing that also that writing that to a log file. Um, and because you can do this context annotation stuff, um, it's really nice. We, for example, we always annotate uh, everything with the virtual machine name that we're working on. And we, we put all of that in a single log file. But because everything is prefixed with the virtual machi machine name, we can both see what happens in parallel between multiple machines. And we can grab and see what's happened in a single machine. Uh, and that is quite nice. He, who here knows expect? All right. Who knows p expect? Excellent. That's almost the same people knowing both. Um, so expect is a utility that allows you to automate anything that has a shell interface, like a anything that expects you as a human to interact with it on a, in a terminal. And uh, the code you write uh, basically looks like okay, start a pro start a, start a process, and then watch its output. And then you match, you give it, you give it certain patterns, uh, and then it tells you pattern number one, two, three, four has matched, and then you can do something, and then you, can, you send more input, and you, you look at the output. And we use that, for example, to automate uh, our switch configs. We're not configuring the switches, but regularly running a script and ask them to output the running config so we can pipe it away. Um, that was quite quite easy to do actually and in, uh, in, in doing you can do that with expect and shell but in python it's so nice because you get actual <laughs> real programming language with typing and and everything it's much easier to um, to work with and uh, look at it after years um, the problem with that is um, we could have just done this <laughs> 
Switches aren't usually documented very well. Um, so after, I think, eight years, we figured out that their SCP interface has the ability to just give us what we want without doing all that. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah. Um, Exignet, uh, who here knows Exignet? Are you pointing to somebody else or are you? <laughs> you know that, all right. So Exignet is kind of like making Python mobile for writing agents. Um, it basically lets you spawn sub-processes either locally or through an SSH that runs a version of Python. And as long as Python is uh, installed on the other end, um, it's, you, can, you can pass it a module, so you can see that I'm importing a module and I'm passing the module object to remote exit. And Exignet takes care to put that into the other interpreter and give you a communication channel to that piece of code. And that piece of code has something that is similar to the under under main, if you know that, right? Starting a script with the interpreter, you get under under main, and then you say, I'm doing something, uh, opposed to when I just get imported. And then you get a channel where you can actually have automatically pickled, unpickled data going through. Uh, and that is quite nice. And the last thing I want to show you is Cython. Um, we are abusing that thing um, because we had the need of having a glorified change own where on a Unix change own as a normal user doesn't really give you much. Um, and we had a specific policy that we wanted to allow users to pass files around. Uh, so the problem with that is you can't have a set UID uh, binary that uses shebang. So you can't say, I'm an executable, set UID, and then user in Python. And so Cython, um, you, asked him, you asked Cython to just generate a C file from that, embed the whole Python interpreter, and you get a binary. Uh, and I was surprised that actually the binary doesn't really embed everything. You can do that with dynamic linking, so you get about 100K of binary for this little script, uh, which is okay-ish. Um, I think you can even ask it to, uh, to do that as a, um, uh, as a static uh, linking thing, then we'd end up like two megabytes for this 100 lines uh, Python script. Um, this is one of the things that we are actually currently starting to replace with uh, Rust, uh, uh, because Rust is for these kinds of things just a little bit nicer uh, without all the overhead. Um, but that is something that is helpful. All right. Um, these are the things I wanted to show you where Python is really, really good to us as uh, writing glue code and integrating things. Um, obviously, as we are an open source first and almost open source only company, we do like to contribute. Here are a couple of the things that we uh, pass out as open source ourselves. Um, and um, so finally, I just have to say um, thanks. Actually, thanks twice. Well, give me a second. Um, the one is thanks for listening and wanting to clap. <laughs> and the other is I really, when putting that together, I realized that I've been doing this for almost 18 years, 17 years, and the amount of stuff that you can reuse and that has been useful for such a long time, there are things in there like SQL Alchemy that have been around for more than 10 years, and it's really, really good to make long-term reliable stuff out of these things and also being able to just start in a minute with a few lines of code, this is fantastic. And the community that provides this is really, really good. So thank you two times. Thank you. Are there any questions? Comments? Yes. Uh, thanks for the talk again. It it seems, so this is all very powerful, um, but it seems it's a little brittle in the end. How do you make sure, I mean, there's lots of, you, you said that there's, you can like get the files wrong and then you lock one file which you have already renamed. How do you make sure that it doesn't break? Do you do extensive testing or? Yeah, I mean, um, what I said in the beginning is that you can start quickly um, and then you can grow the loose things, right? So the QEMU code with the locking and the, uh, uh, and the rewriting, for example, has an extensive unit test suite with PyTest where we actually fire up Vagrant with uh, two Vagrant machines, a pre-installed Ceph cluster, and uh, experiment, and, and then actually running PyTest that 
runs QEMU in Vagrant and performs live migrations and stuff like that. And we typically also have uh, a development environment with real hardware where we, for this scenario, have, mon have Chaos Monkey uh, where we can ask it to put real stress on the, uh, uh, on the cluster for like hours and days. Um, and that is where logging then comes in where if you see something like crashing, at, at that point we had the problem that things were getting killed and we didn't know why, uh, where very detailed logging then gives you the data for looking at what actually happened. Um, the, the problem that we had with the locking was only, I was only able to find that after I created the Chaos Monkey when putting, I think, uh, five to 10 migrations per second over 48 hours and having one machine crash <laughs> and then looking at the logs and figuring out like, Oh, okay, so this can't, this, I didn't even have enough logging yet at that point because I didn't expect that. Uh, and just figuring out like, okay, these two things are happening at the same time, that can't be, the only way it can be is that there must be something wrong over here even though we think it's right. Um, yeah, so there's lots of uh, different levels of quality control that you add over time, that is the point. Yes, it might be brittle in the beginning, but it might be good enough for you to get to sleep for this one night to go back to it on the next day. And my point was that, it's not with, like in other ecosystems where you, where you have one tool to do the quick thing and another tool to do it right and you never get around to do it right. More questions? I have one. Sure. You had one code example where you called explicitly Python 2.7. Why not Python 3? Because that's probably the tool that is currently, let me see which one is that. Um, I think it was rather at the end. Oh, that was the Siphon one? Yeah, because we created that like five years ago and we didn't touch it since then. And if I don't touch it, I don't touch yep. it. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, it's a compiled binary anyway. That compiled binary sits around and does what it's supposed to do. So. <laughs> Just being sassy. More questions? Yes. I have a comment because you mentioned Bash in your title. So moving away from Bash to Python is implied some somewhat uh, stupid coding tricks. Uh, Bash here scripts allow you to mix in one file Bash and Python. So oh yeah. Um, okay. So something that I didn't look at here. I, I planned at the beginning, but it turned out that way. So um, there are a couple of libraries that uh, allow you in Python to do shell-like things. Also, I mean, there's various ways to to kind of intermingle them. For us, the thing is, um, I always try to push people to move away from Bash when they start something after three or four lines. And when you notice that they're using arrays and they're using traps and they're using all these kinds of things, at some point it's like, okay, just completely rewrite it in Python. There's no point. Um, and then you end up with things that are 100, 200 lines and nobody wants to touch them. And any I mean, we do have a couple of guys that are really good at Bash and I'm just bad enough at Bash <laughs> that I tend to go to Python rather early. Um, is, a, is there a specific tool you wanted to mention? No, uh, uh, it's a migration path. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, if you it have is, a, yeah. say, 500 line bash script, yeah. and there, yeah. there are those yeah. monsters, yeah. you can start gradually. Right. I mean, something we don't really pay attention to is, is stuff like startup time for most of the tools. So we would also go ahead and just look at specific parts of a bash file and say, hey, let's take those two functions and turn them into, uh, into Python, stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, there is another question. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned Rust as a replacement, a possible replacement for these kind of hacks. Yeah. Uh, what is the specific um, properties of Rust that make it so um, um, useful for this kind of things? Um, so Rust is um, written as a, uh, so Rust ba mainly is about memory safety, right? Uh, being a system development language and being about memory safety. Um, we, and we noticed that compared to uh, Go, and a couple of other languages, um, it actually has a rather simple start to get into, um, and you can actually be quite productive quickly. Um, not as good as in Python, because it's much higher level, but if you need something compiled, then uh, that, that is just, was easy to go to, yeah. It's, it's not that we write many things in it, it's maybe two or three tools at the moment, but this felt rather clunky and <laughs> It was rather simple in, uh, in Rust. Okay. All right, thank you uh, again. Um, one more announcement oh, before oh. the break. Oh. Um, at 12.30, there will be a group photo in the Lichthof, right where, where the lunch is, and the lunch will be there after. Okay, so let's thank uh, Patrick again, and 
sorry, Christian again, I'm so sorry, um, for the illuminating talk. Thank you. I learned a lot today. Thanks.